Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Pandemic as a Portal, Tracking and Enabling New Possibilities. Uh, my name is Beatriz Botero and I am a fellow at the Berman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. And it's my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce you to our panel and our panelists today. Uh, so we are in a Zoom webinar, very, uh, a very paradigmatic form of gathering in our pandemic times. Uh, and in many ways, these times of the coronavirus pandemic have shown many of the injustices and not so nice parts of our societies. We've seen risks of NA surveillance, authoritarianism, racism, various forms of discrimination. But something interesting is happening too. We have seen innovative alternatives, ideas, and projects that, that not long ago seemed impossible emerge uh, and become all of a sudden possible. Today, we'll hear from the founders and participants of three projects that are seeking to capture and document this new possible. Uh, the, um, these projects uh, are COVID-19 policy response, the new possible, and don't go back to normal. And they're all motivated by the belief that archiving and rendering visible these new ideas and alternatives might contribute to shifting our regulatory paradigms and how our post-pandemic world might look like. Um, the speakers' views expressed in what follows are their own and they don't represent the, affiliate, the opinions of the institutions they are affiliated to. Uh, and just, I'll just introduce them, but so just for you to know, if you have questions, there is a Q&A feature in the lower bar of your Zoom platform and you can type your questions then, and then we'll have some time in the Q&A for hopefully discussing many of them. So our speakers. Uh, Elle Travietti is a doctoral candidate at Harvard Law School, a Kennedy Scholar, and an affiliate at the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Her research is on platform, through, platform power through a moral and political philosophical lens and US and EU technology law. She regularly volunteers for Privacy International. Frederike Caltehoya is also part of New Possible with Aletra, and she's a tech policy fellow at Mozilla. Previously, she led Privacy International's work on corporate surveillance, and she has given expert evidence in the European Parliament, the Belgian Parliament, and the UK House of Lords. She holds a master's in Internet Science of the University of Oxford and a BA in Philosophy and, and Politics from Maastricht University. She also has an upcoming book about technology and global justice. Uh, Phoebe Tickel is part of Don't Go Back to Normal Project. Uh, she's a complex system thinker developing methodologies and governance better suited for a complex world. She was previously a researcher at Imperial College London in microbial engineering and is now an associate lecturer at Schumacher College. And her work, uh, she has worked across multiple contexts, applying complexity and systems thinking to many things, governance, organizational design, philanthropy, uh, advising education and other forms of strategy, and she sits on the advisory board of the International Bateson Institute. Francis Cheng is part of COVID-19 Policy Tracker. Uh, he's a software engineer and lead independent researcher at the Giant Family Institute, and in the past he was a designer at IDEO, adjunct faculty in the New School, co-publisher of the New Inquiry, researcher in residence of New Inc., a fellow at the New York Times, and he, has worked on spatial economics model at the Institute for Applied Economic Research. And finally, but not uh, least, Daria Weisman is also part of COVID-19 Policy Tracker. She's a doctoral candidate in criminal justice at CUNY Graduate Center and adjunct graduate faculty in statistics and research design at John Jay College. She's currently working in the public sector and previously worked at Transparency International, the Eurasia Foundation, and was a speech writer and media analyst for the Prime Minister of Georgia. Um, with that introduction, I'll just open it up for our panelists to tell us about the alternatives of our future. Great. Hi. Thanks for having us. Um, so Dari and I will be talking about um, our COVID-19 policy tracker. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, just a little background for how I came to this project. Um, I noticed a lot of people posting examples of um, policies that seemed very progressive and radical um, and as, as a response to COVID-19. So I started collecting them um, on this page here. 
Um, and the way I thought of it was, this is a list of things that we allegedly can't have except that now we can. Um, yeah, so that's how I came to it. I'll let Daria speak. Um, I, um, I started noticing in the beginning of COVID a lot of uh, absurd laws that were being, um, were disappearing, were being revoked. You know, I think, you know, ever since I was a kid, I had a book called uh, um, Why Donkeys Don't Sleep in Bathtubs. You know, the idea of archaic laws that are still in the books um, that could easily re be reversed. And um, I was also seeing uh, really progressive policies, but incidentally progressive. And um, I was thinking about what it would look like to be able to have some kind of um, comprehensive systematic way of organizing some kind of database. And a friend of mine actually sent me Francis's website and we got on the phone and we started discussing what that would look like, which he's already, you know, he has a, a background in building really interesting models. Yeah, so this, so we came together and we started talking about what we would want in such a collection and archive. Um, and this is a site that resulted. Um, so I'll just briefly go over kind of what we have here. Um, the main feature is that we are building this data set of these policies, trying to keep track of uh, what category they fell into, what the nature of the policy change is, um, whether it's a public or private sector led change. Um, we have some other things about like the specific branch of government um, where, where that information was available, um, what level, if that was state, local, or federal, uh, where it occurred, and so on. Um, and then we experimented with a few different ways of actually visualizing this information. And I think one of the most useful ones is this timeline here. So where information about when these policies were expire, uh, would expire was available, we plotted them here just so you could kind of see like the extent of them when they were uh, about to run out um, and so on. And um, we had discussed how to create this taxonomy. It really, it was what took the most time in the beginning. Um, it really was an iterative process. So we were collecting examples and then looking at what sectors they fell in. And then we made a list of what sectors seemed like uh, were, uh, where there were changes happening or most important. And then we were collecting examples based on those sectors. And in terms of debating how to limit the scope, at first we were deciding whether to also include uh, regressive policies. Um, you know, what kinds of changes we wanted to look at, um, what the threshold was. So would we look at policies like, you know, for example, in the court system, uh, you know, the, the profound effects of moving to video. And so what we decided as a rule of thumb is, um, was this, is this something that people have protested for? So all of our examples uh, in our, I think, eight or nine categories are, uh, are issues that people have protested before. Um, and then we worked on the subcategories, which we wanted something that was sort of on a meso level so that it had, there was a uniform set of, um, of criteria so that someone could search through them quickly or look for patterns. Um, and that was an iterative process also. So for example, in healthcare, um, we had examples of, um, I'm trying to find them. Um, lifting uh, archaic blood restrictions for men who have sex with men, uh, lifting Medicare um, work requirements for Medicare, um, New York State allowing foreign trained medical workers to work in, um, to, in New York State. So we put all of those under the category of, what was the category? Uh, lifted regulatory barriers, I think. Lifted regulatory barriers. Yeah. And we did that process for a number of uh, our subcategories. Yeah, and so real quick, just to go over kind of what we were hoping to accomplish with the project. Um, our main goals were to understand where these changes were happening and who was driving them and how long they're supposed to be in place so that people are aware of when the changes are meant to expire so, and they know when to start pressuring people and who to start pressuring to expand or extend them. Um, and then the secondary goal was to create an archive. Um, and then also to, to use um, to create a tool that we can actually do data visualization and actually look for trends. You know, are changes happening at what level of government? Are certain types of uh, lawmakers initiating them? Mayors, governors, legislators? Um, are there certain sectors where they're happening uh, more uh, and happening less? And so building an archive and data visualization. And that is, that is our project. Yeah.
Thank you, that's great. Um, next project. <laughs> There will be a letter I me and I'll start by sharing my screen. So like um, every, uh, every good side project, um, the new possible started with a tweet. Um, just like Daria and Francis, Francis, I had been noting in March, but also in April, um, I had started bookmarking examples of things that changes, decisions, um, policies, but also changes in public opinion that I found were genuinely surprising. And for a long time, I thought it would be really important to, to capture these. Uh, on the one hand, to remember to have an archive of all the things that were suddenly possible, that were seemingly possible all along, so that we can go back to them and, 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 and make more bold demands in the future. And I think the one example that sparked it were discussions about canceling debt, uh, which is a I know friends who have been uh, working on this issue and pu pushing for debt cancellation for a long time. And suddenly in the midst of a pandemic, it's suddenly possible to forgive debt. Um, a few weeks later, so we started the new possible. I think the moment um, I tweeted saying, I would love to collect these examples. Somebody uh, showed me um, the COVID policy tracker um, which is very detailed and, and uh, has lots of subcategories and has a US focus. So also based on seeing this, I thought we want to do something slightly different as in we do not aim to have a create a comprehensive archive of everything that is happening, but the purpose is twofold. So on the one hand, this is a repository, it's an archive of ideas, but it's also a prompt for further action and policy changes. Um, because we also noticed um, for example, the way in which uh, lost in translation uh, changes that were happening in Italy were being reported in the UK. Sometimes they were being misreported. So what started as a simple repository of news stories uh, quickly became a little bit more where we provided um, different uh, con more context and background to each of the stories. So one, one good example is um, there were suddenly reports that a universal basic income would be introduced in Spain and people kept emailing us that we should include this in the archive, but it turns out that's actually not the policy change that was happening. That's just how it was being reported in other European countries. So what started as a small project for, by Letra and me, we're now a group of volunteers. We have people in the US, UK, Germany, and Italy helping us. And Emma Lopez from Valencia also created a Spanish version of the site. So this is what the site currently looks like. So you can see we do have uh, categories, but they're very broad. So it's transportation, economy, society, cities. Uh, something we notice is that lots of changes were happening on the local level. So a lot of, lot of cities were making very progressive decisions. And we do accept submissions. Recently, we agreed on submission criteria, which we always implicitly had, but we now articulated them more clearly. So the criteria are we want to document and explain policy changes and grassroots initiatives. Um, we included that to, to ensure that change does not just come from government, um, especially in parts of the world where the government is more repressive. Um, but these changes have to have become possible as a result of the pandemic. We also decided to focus on positive changes. Um, and then we defined this to mean uh, changes that lead to more environmentally sustainable, democratic, inclusive, equitable and more just societies. That's still vague and broad, but we had a case where the US Supreme Court was allow allowing um, phone calls and we were thinking um, that was one case where we weren't sure, is this generally positive or is, is this simply different? And finally, I think what's really important is that all of these are possibilities that activists or communities have been uh, fighting for for a long time, that they were also being told that they are impossible, unrealistic. And we're striving to collect from uh, example from different parts of the world, um, but obviously we are limited in, in based on who we are, the languages that we speak. Um, so we have a Euro we have a strong European bias, and that we have lots of examples from local government and cities from Europe, but we lack examples, let's say, from Latin America. And with this, I'm handing it over to Letra. Um, so, as Frederica said, the project has two main functions. So on the one hand, it's um, conceived as an archive, as a repository of things that are happening um, and that are possible. 
And on the other hand, it's supposed to be a source of inspiration for future action. Um, so it's also forward looking. And obviously what happened is that the pandemic is um, shifting, it's moving geographically and it's um, becoming more salient in certain regions, less salient in others as time progresses. And so as time progresses, things kind of changed also for us because um, so both Frederick and I are currently located in Europe, which was one of the early um, loci lo of the pandemic and is now relatively um, less uh, central, I would say. And so we've also started thinking with our collaborators about what the future of this project might have to look like. Do we want to maintain it as it is? Should it be a relatively static archive? Should it be an evolving archive? Should we include different kinds of things on the website? And what kind of direction do we want this project to take? So reflecting on this moment um, in history and this really important um, moment of breakdown or shift, I was thinking there are three possible metaphors that might help us think um, what exactly the pandemic is doing. So on the one hand, we can understand the pandemic as a catalyzer, as an accelerator of dynamics and paradigms and structures that pre-existed, but that were less salient, less aggravated, less exacerbated. And so here, um, so that's one perspective on the pandemic, a lot of people have said, oh, nothing's really changing, it's just being accelerated. And for example, we see um, lots of neoliberal um, kinds of policies, privatizations, giving more and more power to private tech companies to handle and take care of services that would otherwise normally be considered within the scope of government's action and um, competences. So that's one way in which trends of neoliberalization have been really accelerating. Another thing that has been accelerating is the ex exacerbation of inequality, as we've seen um, in the last few weeks, um, and anger and exclusion. Um, so obviously that's another um, way in which we're really seeing how the pandemic has accelerated and acted as a, cat as a catalyzer. The second metaphor is the pandemic as a form of breakdown, as a moment in, in which things break down, change, and suddenly become visible. And it's suddenly a moment to start seeing and reevaluating certain structures and paradigms um, that we operated under. And so here, one really um, salient example is the environmental question. So the pandemic has obviously completely shifted our um, impact on the climate, um, not necessarily because of our own will or not necessarily in a way that we control, but it has brought us to a, a world that seemed completely impossible um, just six months ago. And so somehow it acted as a moment of breakdown where we could actually see in action some of the consequences and some of the possibilities that six months ago seemed completely crazy and unbelievable. Um, the other one is healthcare. And I think of the US in particular um, and uh, countries where healthcare is privatized and where there is no universal right to free basic healthcare. And I think um, situations like COVID-19 are highlighting the need for further access to healthcare for all and are highlighting the need for all to be able to access healthcare for the, the welfare of others. So my right to healthcare protects someone else. And I think that's a very powerful um, realization that comes with the pandemic and really shifts some important paradigms. And then finally, the pandemic is a portal, which is Arundhati Roy's uh, Arundha uh, metaphor. And that's the, um, that's the idea that it's an, an opening. It's a window on something different. It could be very much of the same and accelerated 
Um, so a, a kind of different exacerbated similarity. It could be something entirely distinct and entirely unforeseeable. Um, but the idea is that there might be some optimism that we, we are at a moment when we can change certain things. And so um, while the portal can bring um, negativity and disillusion, it's also a time to start acting, to start um, showing, to start seeing, to start discussing um, possible futures that we want to bring about. So with this said, um, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So what are we thinking about for this project? There are lots of challenges, questions, things we're thinking about, and we would love input. We would love if people are interested in our project, please come forward, please, please email us. Um, so there are questions about how to maintain the website. For the moment, it's a side project for all of us. So we do it in the weekend. We do it when we have a moment of spare time. Um, we basically take news and um, submissions that the public submits to us and we take it on and then do a selection um, using the criteria that Frederica explained. And then we decide uh, to publish or not to publish. It's not a, a repository that's supposed to be exhaustive in any sense. It's very much a selection that we think is helpful to kind of get a sense of what's happening in the world. We want to expand it geographically. We would like to get more perspectives from around the world, from people who have different experiences to us, different languages. So we're very interested in expanding in that sense. And finally, we would, we, we're starting to think about potentially diversifying the kinds of content that we have on the website. And so we're thinking about um, the second function of the website, which is forward looking, um, moving towards action. And we're thinking about bringing in policymakers and people who actually work on policy changes and maybe have interviews or videos with them, trying to trace policy change from its roots to its ultimate um, implementation. Um, so that's an idea that we're uh, playing with right now. And so we're thinking video podcasts, we're thinking all sorts of um, media. And if you're interested, we would love to hear from you. Stop screen Thank share. I think the Just next project can go. Before, before we hear from Phoebe, which is our, who's our last speaker, I want to tell the audience that you can access all these projects online. Uh, the links are on the events site, so don't stop here. And then you can also engage with them directly and scroll down by yourself. And now our last uh, project, the floor is yours or the screen. Thank you. I'll just, uh, I'm just gonna get my slides up. Okay. Can you see that? Great. Uh, so hi everyone, thank you for the invitation to take part. It's really, it's really great to be among um, so many great projects that kind of interlink and, and potentially have this ability to be like a tapestry, I guess, in this moment um, of ways we can not go back to normal or ways we can help uh, manifest this new possible. So the project that I'm here to talk about, uh, I co-founded with somebody called Stephen Reed, and it's called Don't, Be Don't Go Back to Normal, um, which I think is quite self-explanatory in, in the message that we're trying to put out. Um, but we, I'll say a little bit about the genesis of it, but just to give you a, an idea of what it is, um, I've put the link into the chat if you wanna click on it. Um, it's essentially a platform of alternatives, uh, alternatives meaning like services, tools, um, ways of working, ways of decision-making, like in a, in a kind of categorized list that makes it really easy for people to see the alternatives that can replace the old way of doing things with new ways of doing things. And the new ways are essentially uh, a whole range of things like technology that is open source, uh, technology that has better privacy and security, um, services that prioritize localism, sustainability. Uh, so you can click through and have a look and I'll, I'll go through some examples. Um, but the way we imagine this project was basically being a full stack, like a full societal stack of alternatives that people can very easily one by one shift over to. And we, as a project, we resonate most with this pandemic as a portal metaphor because it's 
we see this kind of Overton window uh, also for consumer behavior and, and potentially while everybody's pausing and in lockdown, they can actually use this moment to, to kind of reflect and uh, make those changes. So kind of transition from, uh, let's say, an unethical bank to an ethical bank. So this is the, the URL. Right now we've got the URL, don't go back to normal.world, but also don't go back to normal.uk because we'd really like to encourage uh, people from other countries to uh, get in touch with us. We've made all of the code of the website open source. It's all built on Airtable and it's very, very easy to make copies of it. Um, and we've had somebody, a team in touch from Germany and a team in touch from the US who are interested in creating don't go back to normal.us or uh, dot yeah, .com, don't go back to normal dot, uh, de. So we, we'd like to build up this uh, whole stack across different countries and we want to kind of own that we can only give advice to uh, in a local like geographical context, we can't give advice globally. Uh, so this is uh, myself and Stephen, we, we co-founded this in mid-April and it, the genesis of the project was essentially a phone call where um, I had I'd spent the last month like very, very activated and writing all sorts of articles about, uh, for example, like the need for lockdown before the lockdown happened. Like I, I was really, and I was, very, I was feeling a lot of urgency that the pandemic in a way is a bit like a dry run for the sorts of changes we need to go through um, for, for climate change and kind of long-term civilizational survival as well. And we were talking on the phone with Stephen, who's a software developer, and also we both have a complexity and systems change, uh, complexity and systems thinking background that we've both applied to systems change in different ways. Um, and, and we were just talking about the opportunity of this moment, actually, like to help people uh, see that the old ways of doing things are, are not great and that they can not go back to normal. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the examples of our site and then talk a bit about what we're thinking about for the future and ways that you can support or get involved. Um, these are the different categories, so I'm not going to show all of them, but just to give you a sense of what the website looks like and uh, talk through some of these examples. So for each category, I think there are 10 categories in total, we are choosing maximum three options because our, our desire with this project is to keep it really, really simple. Like part of our hypothesis is that there's so many alternatives out there and there's so much advice and there's so much kind of uh, competition of, of what's the best tool that we want to try and be a kind of filter and, and uh, give people a really easy way to see some alternatives that they can very easily transition to today. So for doing food differently, uh, we've got some like community supported agriculture schemes, like uh, an odd, odd box, like using, um, getting these like boxes of vegetables that are, are wonky or, or rejected from supermarkets. We've got the Open Food Network, which is an open source tech platform that helps people connect to local farmers. This is doing decision-making differently. So uh, forms of like flat decision-making, non-hierarchical decision-making, for example, holacracy. Uh, this is an example of social media. So different platforms that are actually open source or uh, cooperatively owned. Uh, doing video and messaging differently. So this feels especially important, like in this moment, so many people have transitioned to working and having uh, conversations with family on Zoom. Um, but actually we're finding out that Zoom doesn't have very good kind of privacy and security policies and, and, and is not, you know, it's a, it's a large corporation that owns it. So yeah, there's this importance of actually transitioning to uh, platforms that put people and ethics and security and privacy and kind of freedom first. Then we've got do work differently. So these are kind of different ways of working, horizontal organizations or like collaborative uh, work patterns, doing budgeting differently. So this is a co-budget is a tool I was involved. Uh, I, I'm part of the collective that created co-budget um, and it's essentially a tool, online tool that allows groups to do budgeting together in a totally transparent um, and open way. Um, so that's just one example of another tool. Doing ownership differently, so prior, like promoting cooperative company structures instead of you know, shareholder owned companies. Uh, that's all, that's, yeah, th those are all, there are more categories on the site, but I didn't want to have to go through every single one. But um, yeah, just to say that it's, as, as uh, Electra said, like this is also not an exhaustive list and the idea is that it's curated. And actually Stephen and I 
either know people, need, know the people who um, run the projects or own the projects, or we've worked with them in some way before, or we've like verified. So there's like a lot of due diligence that's kind of gone into choosing what is on this site. And that's part of like the value that we want to um, bring to people is that, yeah, a kind of trusted source of top uh, projects or services that they can move to. The last thing I wanted to say was, I guess both of us, both Stephen and I are uh, really passionate about the kind of whole systems change. And we've got this idea that, um, I guess because of our complexity and systems backgrounds, we believe that potentially all of the changes kind of have to happen at once. Like you can't kind of just go slowly one by one. It's gonna be a total transformation that we need um, in quite a short space of time. And, you know, it might sound crazy that, that, you know, that there's a reality where all of us are buying our food from community supported agriculture or um, that all of us are using Scuttlebutt instead of Facebook, but essentially that's the place we need to get to. And this project is an attempt to help that shift happen. Uh, we've got our launch event on the 23rd of June. Uh, I will put the link into the chat because I haven't got the link up here, but you'd all be very welcome. And uh, this is my website. This is Stephen's website. If you'd like to be in touch, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for those great presentations and great work. Um, before we open it up for the Q&A, but I want to encourage the audience to submit your questions. We have maybe two lined up, but not that many, so go ahead. I have a few questions for, for you first. Um, I want to ask you, what is one of the most surprising things that you've encountered as you've uh, curated this material? What policy changes have surprised you? And how those have changed uh, throughout time. Uh, I think maybe the latest project uh, was started in April, but how, how have you seen the mood change? Uh, so the question is how have things changed? How's, how have I seen the- What has surprised you and what has changed since you started? Okay, uh, I'm gonna start with the second question. So what I've seen change, I guess is the, you know, the energy and momentum that, that I think a lot of us could feel in March and April in the sense of like, uh, you know, I think, many of us are, are utopian at heart who start these projects and there's a sense of like, oh, things could be different. You know, another, another world is possible. Um, and now I think I'm starting to think about crises, for example, 9-11 and what happens after a crisis. Like often there's an immediate response of loads of like goodwill and collaboration and hope. And then, I mean, if we look at 9-11, what's happened uh, after that, like the impact on the way the world, um, you know, politics and policies and uh, culture changed after that. Like I, I'm just concerned about what, yeah, about what might happen after this crisis and how do we work together to make sure that you know this is potentially a catalyst for greater change and um, helps be, you know, when you've got like a saturated kind of solution and you just add like a like a grain of dust and it turns into a solid like that i'm kind of wondering if we can really find what that catalyst is to to crystallize uh, better ways of doing society and uh sorry what has surprised me it's a really hard question i'm actually going to pass to someone else i, I can't think okay. of what surprised me. do the new normal uh, founders have Something that has surprised them or something on how, how it's changed? Federica or Eletra? I think there's, there's one example that I think both Eletra and I found always very fascinating. And that was the fact that at some point in the pandemic, Amazon has nudged users to buy less, not more. And I find this fascinating. It's not radical. Um, there are lots of things to criticize about Amazon's, the way that Amazon has handled this crisis, but I thought it's interesting that the very same tools that currently optimize for one goal can very quickly be utilized to optimize for a different goal. This one I found fascinating. I think another one was, um, but on, only because I, I, um, I'm not where I usually live and I've been living in sublet. So I spend a lot of time monitoring Airbnb for very personal reasons. But what was interesting to, to really, I could really see and observe how holiday rentals were entering the long-term rental market. And there was a moment in April when this was happening a lot. And now it's, it's again sort of the atmosphere in Berlin at the moment is the pandemic is over, which it really isn't. But that's the general mood. And it's 
it's immediately reflected in, 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 in holiday rentals and the way that um, landlords behave. Um, and on the overall question, I'd also say the, I think the being in Europe, the, the mood at the moment is very different than it was in March. In March, um, we also did this project to practice optimism at a time that felt extremely dark to, to really celebrate and highlight all the positive changes that are happening. And with a lot of things, I feel this moment has passed a little bit, but also this pandemic isn't over. So I think we're in this strange period at the moment where in some places, places it, there's the appearance of normalcy, but that's not the radical new normal that we thought it would be. Um, so, which makes it more important than ever to track and remember all these radical possibilities that were possible and that still are possible uh, and to, to follow up on them and, and make sure um, that we keep, keep the possible open and not go back to very narrow or even dystopian um, versions of the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to mention two different ones. Um, from Frederica. So one that um, I found really interesting. So I'm Italian and there were lots of news about the Venice canals being super clean and having never been as clean, which I found um, very exciting and also very pretty. So we have we have a news on that on the website. And the other one is a very recent one. It's um, the announcement by I IBM, Amazon and now Microsoft that they would stop supplying facial recognition software to the police. Um, there are obviously questions on how that will play out and whether that's a full commitment or not, but I think that's significant and very recent. In terms of how things changed, um, just one reflection um, is if you look at the numbers of cases around the world, it's quite interesting to see what countries are doing badly and what countries have done well, obviously we're not at the end of the pandemic. We can't um, draw final um, conclusions about this, but it's pretty telling that a lot of the countries that are led by populist leaders um, have done fairly poorly um, in these times. So on the one hand, I think that's a positive message. It tells us there is something wrong with some of the way you know, some of the directions that politics has been um, moving towards in recent years. On the other hand, there's a question, I think, as things change, as people get more and more unhappy and poor and um, excluded, um, whether some, some of these kinds of policies will actually start gaining traction again um, and discontent um, might take over and lead to some really concerning results. So, so I think that's my kind of gray, black, you know, positive and negative um, conclusion. Yeah. Um, should I start, Francis? Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, and again, our project is about the focus on the United States. Um, the the ability to house the unhoused to house the homeless so quickly um and with uh with the same budget that there was before um uh really surprised me um when when the issue was about um uh covid and spreading covid um same with jails and prisons uh really kind of extraordinary people, uh, criminal justice reformers in the United States have been pushing for these changes for decades. And uh, this, you know, when we've been told that it's difficult or impossible for a variety of reasons that suddenly disappeared. And um, the, you know, I'm hoping this will trigger larger questions about what, how the US uses its prisons a, obviously, besides the profit motivation, um, I know this word was so sorry. Um, on on cue, always whenever I get on a Zoom call, um, but also that the um, that these releases are for people who don't aren't public um, aren't risks, aren't security risks. What you know? How are we using our prisons? I think what's changed 
Um, I think this fatigue has set in. I think we believe in law and governance a lot less now than we did three months ago in the US, the same way we believed in it less three months ago than we did a year ago. And so what's interesting is the way that we envision this project is sort of incidentally progressive policies that were changing for other reasons to deal with the economy, to deal to mitigate the spread. But now the most, to my mind, significant re uh, reform in the past, I mean, really extraordinary is police reform and the way that it's actually being the, the protests which, um, you know, I'm still thinking through how they're connected to COVID. They're clearly very deeply entwined. But this is something that is being propelled by, um, by people, by citizens, and then is prompting governments to be responsive as opposed to governments trying to mitigate their own crises and giving more, uh, providing more humane. And the last thing is, I think a lot more people are, progressivism, I've seen this, or people are scared of it, but they're actually, they are progressive. You don't use that word in the US. Um, you say to someone, would you like student debt forgiveness? Would you like healthcare? Would you like a basic level of human rights and a humane you know, style of living? People will say yes, but then if you frame it a different way, they get very scared. So I think that there's something in the framing of how to hopefully push forward. But I, sadly, I'm not very optimistic. I think a lot of these are one-offs. You know, for example, prison releases, this has not risen to the level of policy. And I, I think we're gonna see a lot of evictions right now if there isn't an extension uh, and there's a cri crisis in the making uh, that hopefully will prompt better reforms. Um, yeah, just to build on what everyone else has said, um, I think one of the most surprising changes for me is not actually from the policy side, but um, in the US at least, there's been kind of this uh, rise in interest in mutual aid and these kind of hmm. non-governmental um, ways of su uh, support structures. And that's been really encouraging to see. Um, in terms of how, I guess my own kind of thinking about this has changed. Um, uh, I guess there are two things. One is that it seems to me, like a lot of these policy responses weren't so much about, um, I guess, yeah, they weren't really about addressing the pandemic per se, but controlling the economic consequences of it. Um, and it seems that the economic consequences, the narrative that's kind of emerged is that they're more to do with the shutdown in response to the pandemic as opposed to the pandemic itself. itself. And um, now with all these kind of rushed reopenings here, it seems the decision is now that, um, we can avoid a lot of this economic fallout if we just don't shut down. Um, and so that's kind of a worrying trend for me. Um, the other is, I think Dari already touched on this, but a lot of these policies um, aren't really kind of long-term changes. They're more um, a kind of pause button. So um, in the US, for instance, there's been many eviction moratoriums um, but the problem is that those have largely not included any kind of rent forgiveness. So you can't be evicted for three months for not paying your rent, but at the end of these three months, you still have to pay the three months of missed rent. So that's effectively just delaying the consequences. Um, so that's been a little discouraging as well. Thank you. Um, so the, the questions from the audience are piling up, uh, but I wanna just ask another general question to you uh, and then we'll read from the Q&A feature your questions. What, I, I want to hear a little bit maybe if, if, you, if you haven't yet spoken about this, about the personal experience uh, for you about running these portals, doing it as a side project, uh, what have you learned, uh, what, what has been challenging, and maybe if you can also throw in uh, how people could help, like tell us a little bit what this has meant for you. Like I hear different uh, inclinations towards optimism and uh, less optimism. So maybe if you tell us a little bit about that. Whoever wants to, yeah, go ahead. Um, we need help. And if anyone is interested or knows anyone, that would be wonderful. The idea for this to, to, be, to work is, is to be able to see patterns, is that we collect a lot of things and at a, at a specific level of detail. And we had gone back and forth on, you know, depth versus breath, and we're trying to do both. but. It is so time consuming. We both have full-time jobs. 
um, that, um, you know, it took us, I think the taxonomy still works, um, the structure works, but we really want to be able to collect these examples and be able to have this as really as an archive. Um, and it's too much work for the two of us. And it would be great to do something, you know, a lot of these great trackers are using uh, the Google Doc share, where you, you'll see 45 people on the document at the same time. Um, we want to be able to vet everything and, and fact check it first, but you know, some kind of modification. Uh, if you go to our website, you can um, you can send in examples, and Francis has built a backend for that. Um, if you want, if you know anyone who would like to help, please, that would be wonderful. So that is that is our pitch to you. I think in sort of like what 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 we need is we are at a different so we decided not to be an archive but a narrative a storytelling mm -hmm. a curated collection of examples and what we need help with is um figuring out where to where to take this next um given that these stories are just not coming in anymore we could sort of try to preserve them help promote them but there are also different approaches. Um, I think this is one, and then the other one is we are, and that was just a quick lazy solution. We're hosting this on Squarespace, which just costs money to maintain, which is fine for now. But if this were supposed to be sort of, it needs a longer term home basically. Um, maybe, and let's have, do you have, maybe have different thoughts or additions on this? Um, I was thinking, um, so one thing that was surprising for me was, to realize how complex it is to so if you decide that you want to put positive changes on the website how complicated it is to decide whether something is actually positive and also once you start looking into the piece of news and related coverage you realize it's actually pretty opportunistic or a one-off or it was planned all the way but there are implementing it uh, perhaps a little bit more quickly now. Um, so a lot of the things that look surprising actually are not that surprising. And it's pretty rare to find something that's genuinely surprising that um, was being pushed for for a long time and denied and then suddenly it's happening. So I think that's, um, I guess, my takeaway from this. And obviously it takes time. Um, but it's but but it's also been a really great experience and i must say i don't know i really like these projects like all of the ones that have been um, presented because i think they give this sense of optimism and the sense that actually you know yes everything is gray there are positive and negative things but there's always a, a possibility for change and i think that's really important Maybe one small, building on this, one small point is sort of what is positive for some, what is surprising for some is not necessarily surprising for others. So through collecting these examples, I learned a lot about uh, the criminal justice system in Europe that I didn't, I didn't know, which is on me, I didn't know the extent to which European prisons are overcrowded and what a big deal it is that currently they are not and how long, how many reports by human rights organizations were there for a long time. Um, um, yeah, so we also need help. Uh, I'd say it, we, it's also a side project um, and any, any help is really welcome. We, we have a, a board of advisors. So if you're, you're an expert in any of the categories that are on our website, like food, alternative food systems or alternative like technology or ownership, please do get in touch and, and we'd love to have you. Like we're happy to have 50 advisors if, if that's um, what, what wants to happen. Um, on the site itself at the bottom, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a little like submit an alternative. So if you have any ideas of tools or services that are not uh, currently there, then you can scroll down and tell us, uh, yeah, like submit um, a project or a tool that you think should be on our um, database. Um, I think, you know, generally we just want this to go as far as possible because we want as many people to see these alternatives as possible so sharing the site is really helpful um we've just we've actually only just launched it publicly like we've had it built for the last couple of weeks but we've just been putting everything in place and sorting out the platform so um yeah sharing it in the next week would be, would be super helpful um and i think the experience of doing the project like i think it gave me a kind of longer term view out of the the pandemic of just like, okay, this is a long game. Like we, yeah, 
it's, it's giving me like a sense of if we want to get here, like if we want to, if we're going somewhere, like how could that happen? How long would that take? It's not going to happen in three months. It's going to take years, but um, using some of this momentum uh, seems like a pretty good, good idea. Um, yeah, I think that's everything I would say. I would, I would just add as well, I'm, I'm interested in talking with Frederica and um, Electra afterwards, because I wonder if there are ways, in my, in my mind, I was trying to think about how they connect, that they're like, here are these tools or services like that can help you move towards the new possible. And then you are kind of gathering evidence that it's happening. And I don't know, it could be kind of interesting to think about how they connect. That's in all directions, right? Like the, the taxonomy of the COVID policy tracker, I was also thinking maybe we should have been more systematic. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, some of the questions on the Q&A ask about the relationship between the civil rights uprising, mainly in the US, but now also expanding into Europe. Uh, well, I don't know if civil rights uprising is the right word, like the anti-racism and anti-blackness movement um, that we've, we've seen in the past few weeks, and the role of tech companies and platforms. So this sort of started maybe last week when IBM decided that they wouldn't sell a facial recognition software to a police a department in the US. And there, there's an interesting set of questions here about how do you see that playing out in the near future, like the relationship between the political context and the role of tech companies. I don't know if any of you have some thoughts on that easy question. Or hunches, hunches is the word. So I'll, I'll try, I'll respond. Go for uh, it. Tiny, you know, I'll give my five cents. Um, so someone I think asked about scope. So how do we limit the scope of our website to the pandemic and how do we distinguish efforts that have emerged as a result of the pandemic versus other things, including anti-racist protests, etc. Um, we don't make distinctions and that's something that we've been thinking about now. We don't necessarily distinguish between the pandemic and everything else that's happening. And as Daria said, they're probably extremely connected. And, um, and so we think it's part of the same big moment of change. Um, what the role of um, so I, I don't know if the question is what the role of tech companies has been in relation to the anti-racist protests and how does it connect to the pandemic or just separate questions one and the other. So I think they're separate questions and I pile them together so you can do whatever. Okay, so I'll just respond on the tech companies point, yeah. which I think is something that I covered in my presentation. I think broadly we're seeing tech companies taking advantage of the moment and trying to um, take on more and more um, aspects of private lives, of governmental functions, et cetera. So they want to be depicted and, and seen as good guys and often they are trying to do good things. So I mean, in, in the, um, the contact tracing apps question, um, I think, largely they're seen as doing the right thing. They're trying to put forward solutions that are more privacy protective, but it's part of a general strategy of acquiring more and more credibility, trustworthiness, and power over people's lives, especially in light of the fact that our lives are becoming more and more virtual and more and more mediated through these platforms, infrastructures. So my view is pessimistic. I think we need to push back. I think, I think Naomi Klein called this a digital land grabbing that's happening. Um, so there are surveillance companies pitching in. Um, it, it, it's very much both. I'm also pessimistic. Um, so it's important to push back and exercise sort of like a watchdog function on everything that's happening to technology at the moment. And just because the I just one sentence to add, I want everybody else to speak as well, but to say we, we struggled a little bit with sort of the protests and how to reflect them on the website. And the reason was a lot of the changes are also the consequence of years of activism and work. And we didn't want to give the impression that this is because of the pandemic that we're seeing these changes. 
they're probably it's probably a catalyst but especially when it comes to ibm and amazon th there's been lots of activism that has been demanding that they stop face recognition and it wouldn't be too easy to say it's because of the pandemic maybe there's a catalyst factor but it's sort of it's complicated i guess i, I would just uh chip in around like it's it, it, I, I mean i don't think it should be up to citizens and like in our personal choices like i think unfortunately that's kind of where we are though that if we want to choose more ethical and secure alternatives like it's on us and unfortunately it also means that you know if we're all on facebook then the benefit of being on facebook is that everybody's on facebook so it's like how do you get I think a question I sit with a lot is how do you get like a momentum or like a mass exodus to other platforms because they're there, they're available and they would become much better if we put money into them instead of using these free platforms where there's these invisible costs like your data is basically my, you know, mined. Like if, if you're not paying, then you're paying through being watched, surveyed um, and you know, having targeted advertising and like much worse, like being manipulated, targeted, there's, you know, watch Cambridge Analytica, like the film, it, it's, it's all there for us to see, but we're kind of hooked to these platforms that um, are kind of mining, like farming us for, for data. And uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, that's not really an answer. The, the, my answer is, here's a, here's a platform that shows the alternatives, but how we get enough people onto those so that it's actually um, plays the function, like is beneficial to be there and plays the function that, that these platforms should. Uh, is is an open question. I don't know if anybody wants to riff riff on that or. Okay, so we can go for the next question. So there's a there's an interesting question about something that you have mentioned already uh, in your different interventions about the short term versus long term uh, nature of some of the projects and ideas uh, you've been following. So, um, so yeah, so the, I, I'm gonna read it because it's interesting. So what obstacles have you found in making the new possible and that type of short-term interesting policy or response that you're seeing is stay? And like, for example, in the prison reform cases that you have all mentioned, or maybe in even uh, asking Amazon to, show, uh, uh, having Amazon not incentivizing us to shop too much or that type of thing. How do you think we could stick to, to those or what are obstacles? You know, I think it's a question of political will and I think we're still in a crisis and um, no one is really making um, medium term as far as I've seen in, 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 this, in this space, um, medium term or, or long term policy decisions. So I think there is a moment, it's interesting, all the trackers that I follow in criminal justice that follow jail releases, prison releases, um, uh, questions on pretrial detention, they all sort of stopped. Um, all the policies stopped and the trackers are stopped mid April. I think that there was a moment of uh, who, the people who are gonna be released were released. And so, and they haven't, Brit they've, um, because the, the courts, a lot of them are on pause in various ways for, for various types of low level crimes and misdemeanors that usually end up in, in jail churn. Um, so no one's had to really think about this in a sustained way. Um, you know, I think in, if it, when it benefits companies, um, you know, we, we've been following employment. I think a lot of the flexible work and, and remote work arrangements um, I, I say that someone works in government where there's, that has never been the case before. I think when people see that it works and for companies that it's cheaper for them, and you see what Twitter, I think Facebook, or a, a number of big uh, tech companies. In regards to um, progressive social public policies, unless people push for it, I think there's gonna be this kind of reactionary law and order criminal justice response again especially because that tends to be this kind of authoritarian personality emerges during moments of crisis. I mean, we see it, we're seeing it all over the place. So even, um, you know, even in terms of criminal justice, we've looked at bail reform, even when that, when bail reform, so it's a completely, it's an awful system in which the majority of people are in prison because they can't afford to pay, to pay bail before they've actually been convicted. Um, 
the uh, there's been a, 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 a movement to reform, to release and recognizance. Uh, there's been so much pushback against that, even when it shows that it hasn't increased, you know, any kind of metric of crime, things like that. So um, we know that it's emotional. We know that it's not logical and it's not based on, on the reality. And so if people continue to respond fearfully, we're going to see pushback, I think, unfortunately. Um. So I have something maybe to respond to this, which is, I think the key to long-term change, and again, five cent, the key to long-term change is to shift the paradigms. Um, so I think we currently live in times where certain forms of economic um, logics tend to be supreme and govern lots of policy making and so policy is shaped so as to fit certain kinds of considerations from a cost benefit analysis. And I think it's key um, to progressively move away from that in order to have lasting change. And how do you do that? So one way of doing that is starting by securing certain forms of well-being to those who are the least able to understand what is in their interest potentially and vote for it. Um, and so I believe firmly in welfare and the welfare state. And I think if you give health care to people, people start understanding why it's valuable and they start understanding why a lot of other things are valuable. Um, so you need to start somewhere and then you, you need to start shifting paradigms and start showing that a lot of the things are currently considered in some countries as um, disastrous are actually not at all disastrous. Um, I would just uh, chip in that the long term, I mean, seeing the impact of, say, Extinction Rebellion or the current uh, Black Lives Matter protests, like I guess protest and uh, movements has got a role to play here. They can kind of, you know, there's the the study that Extinction Rebellion was based on that shows that 3.5% of uh, the population is all you need for kind of massive paradigm change or, you know, you know movements to succeed based on um, past movements that have worked in the, in the past around like civil rights. So yeah, that, that's, uh, I think that's one piece of the puzzle. Well, in that sense, your projects seem very important uh, for the moment. Um, we have some time, so we have two uh, specific questions that I'm going to read, and then if you have something to say about them, uh, please do. Um, one of them is whether you've seen projects, including those without much access to digital platforms or the internet, like whether you've seen something new in that sense that has, uh, I don't know, caught your attention. And the other one is something you've mentioned in the passing as well, some of you, but maybe if you have some thoughts on whether uh, our, or whether the pandemic has, will enlarge or, or shrink maybe our privacy and civil rights, like how you see that playing out. I, it's funny because I feel we're all very touched by your projects. And so it seems like we, you, we want you to tell us about the future that awaits us. Uh, but you for sure have been looking into the possible future. So please, uh, yeah, so those, those two questions. I don't know if you have thoughts on them. Maybe Frederike, go ahead. And then Daria. I don't have to go first, but I think that oh, the, irony, the irony is that my normal job is tracking the negative and the dystopian, which is why I enjoyed this project so much. Um, there are lots of trackers and projects out there that track precisely the, the, the shrinkage of civil, civil rights and um, I think one takeaway from this is like, even if you think in terms of human, human rights law, in a global pandemic, you, it, is, it can be justified to restrict liberties if they're lawful, proportionate, uh, time limited and strictly necessary. So a lot of this, my answer to the question is basically, well, it's up to us. And a lot of very boring monitoring will have to happen to really see if all restrictions of civil liberties that were meant to be temporary are actually being rolled back. And if a lot of compromises that we made in an emergency will actually end. 
and what will happen to the data that was collected? Will it be repurposed? And all of this will require long-term monitoring. Um, and I, I'm not a big fan of saying, will the pandemic lead to uh, a shrinkage of civil rights? Because it really depends. It's sort of, we're in the midst of it and it's entirely and completely up to us to make it happen, to, to ensure that this is not the case. Thank you. Daria, you also have something to say, I think? I was just gonna ask you to repeat the first question. Oh, um, so the first question was the one on civil rights. And the other one was whether you've seen something about digital inclusion projects along those lines. Uh, I think our panel, Aletra and Frederick are probably better suited to, to answer. So I will defer. Um, so on the digital inclusion question, I think it's a very relevant question. Um, and we basically just thought, let's create this website and have not um, thought through any of those important questions also because it's pretty small scale for now but it's definitely a very um, salient um, consideration that we should take into account if we want to expand the website and make it um, something that can actually guide change for many um, so I think it's very relevant I don't have examples in mind of things that are happening offline that might be kind of analogous to what we're doing on the um, surveillance question i i can only agree with frederick uh, i think it's a question of understanding what we mean by emergency under our constitutional regimes what is possible and not possible for governments to do a lot of what or everything governments have been doing in times of covid is legal and, and acceptable under the law. The question is whether we're happy with these things being done and the potential consequences of these kind of changes and how they might be, to use the language I was using before, shifting paradigms and entrenching certain digital structures, certain apps, certain methods of tracking that didn't exist before and that would now become part of the new normal and we're, we wouldn't be happy. I don't think any of us would be happy with a new normal that is about surveilling individuals more and more. On the other hand, I'm not extremely worried personally about contact tracing apps. I don't think people are using them as much as we would have hoped or some people would have hoped. Um, so I'm less worried about that and I am also conscious that the surveillance is happening anyways and so not much is changing in that sense but things will be changing and it's very important to see what defaults are being put in place. Say something on the digital inclusion because actually in my uh, full-time job I work as a like in a philanthropy fund where we fund community projects and one of the biggest problems we've had during this pandemic is like basically all of the people that are offline are suddenly like completely unavailable and can't be reached. So like people who used to drop into like clinics or uh, children who, you know, like social services are checking in on children, like it's all become really difficult and like short of handing out iPads, like it's, it's yeah, it's really tough to know uh, what to do. Um, my one my two cents around like in connection to the don't go back to normal project is that we'd like to reach out to um the mutual aid networks because they're networks who are online they have whatsapp groups but then they are connected locally to people who don't have you know like the elderly like people who are not connected online and so um for for a project that wants to you know, reach, reach people who are not online. I guess it's about connecting with the people who are online, who are connected with the people who are offline uh, and trying to like mobilize in that way. That's great, thank you. Well, I think our, our time has come to an end. I, I don't know if any of you have something very last to say, but then I think some of the uh, takeaways are that if you are listening and you wanna help them reach out volunteer, send projects and, uh, and ideas. I think uh, that was something that certainly came up. And I just really want to thank you all for taking the time on your spare time to uh, sort of give us all these new paradigms and ideas about how our, our future can look and also to be 
attentive to what's going on around us. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. I let's. This is a a mute clapping, which is one of those awkward things about Zoom event. But we're all clapping for you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, together. Thank you, everyone. An unmuted clap. <laughs> <laughs> you can see in the chat that people are saying thank you and clapping. So. <laughs>